Hi, Internet World. My name is Michelle Horsley, and today I'm going to be telling you about my instrument, which is this. I'm the director of music at South Church in New Britain, Connecticut, which is a little bit south of Hartford, Connecticut, which is where I live. And I'm an organist. This video is part of Make Music Day, June 21st, 2020. And as this video is being aired, I will be answering any questions that you might have in the chat. I'm going to spend the next 40 minutes or so giving you an explanation of what this instrument is and how it works. I hope you enjoy it. So this is a pipe organ. At first glance, you'll see that it has some similarities to a piano in that there are keys. Of course, on a piano, there are 88 keys. And on these keyboards, there are only 61 keys. You'll see that there are three keyboards over here. We call these manuals. So this is a three manual organ. And then there's also a keyboard for your feet. We call that a pedal board. This organ essentially has four divisions, these three manuals and the pedal. And so each one of those divisions sort of has its own stops. These are all the stops associated with the pedal division. These are all the stops associated with this manual. This is called the swell, so the swell division. Over here, we have all of the stops that are associated with the positif division, which is the lowest manual. And over here, the stops that are associated with the grate, which is the middle manual. So basically, you can play different sounds with different hands on different keyboards at the same time. Each of these divisions essentially has different tonal characteristics. So the grate, the middle manual, is sort of known for being the foundational manual. This one up here has a lot of really interesting reeds and string sounds. And the bottom one has some kind of funky mutations and mixtures and sort of soloistic stops. Organists also wear special shoes. These particular shoes are made by a company called Organ Master and they have leather soles, which allow me to slide on the pedal board. Some organists wear dance shoes, which also work just as well. This pedal board is a standard concave radiating 32 note pedal board. What do I mean by that? Well, there are 32 notes. Um, it's concave, meaning that it goes up on the sides so that it's easier to play when you get to the extremities. And it's radiating, meaning that the pedals are not straight, they're kind of splayed out, which also makes it easier to play. We measure the size of pipe organs based off of how many ranks they have, with one rank being essentially a row of pipes. Each of these manuals is 61 notes, so essentially 61 pipes is one rank of pipes. This particular instrument has 62 ranks of pipes, so that means it has 3,579 pipes. And they're all up there. <laughs> Organs date back literally thousands of years. They are among the oldest instruments known to humankind. I think the oldest still playable instrument is from 1310 in Switzerland, which is crazy. <laughs> Ancestors of the organ date back to ancient Greece. In 2000 BC, we can find records of something called a hydrolis, which is a water organ. The organ as we know it, originated from something that used to be quite small, just a couple ranks of pipes. Um, and then <laughs> over many centuries, it got bigger and much more complicated. This organ is not very old. This organ is built in 1972, so it's only about 50 years old. But plenty of people play on organs that are hundreds of years old on a regular basis. There are many different kinds of organs out there. Some are completely electronic, like the, uh, the Hammond B3, which is essentially the sort of quintessential gospel music organ. Another kind of organ is a tracker action or a mechanical action organ. These are sort of more historical designs. Basically, every time you press down a key, that key goes to a tracker, which is essentially like this sort of cord, which then goes to a sort of piece of wood, which goes to another cord, which goes this crazy Ruby Goldberg-esque sort of thing goes directly to the pipe itself. This kind of organ is neither of those two. This is an electro-pneumatic organ. Uh, it is still absolutely a pipe organ. There are lots of pipes up there. But for this kind of organ, there are electronic signals that go from the keys to the pipes. And our particular electro-pneumatic organ, this is what our circuit board looks like. This also allows for this kind of organ to be movable. If I wanted to move the console out to a different area of the sanctuary, I could do that. I just have to pay close attention to this sort of thick snake of cables uh, to make sure I didn't run it over. There are also many different traditions of organ building and styles in which organs are made with some of the sort of most prominent influences coming from France and Germany and the United States. 
you'll find all kinds of different languages represented in the stops on an organ. This particular instrument draws on a lot of German and French styles, but it's really an American instrument. This instrument was built by the Gress Miles Organ Company in 1972. They are located in Princeton, New Jersey. How do dynamics work on an organ? Well, unlike the piano, in which if you press in harder, <laughs> you'll get a louder sound, you can press as loud as you want on these keys and it will still sound the same. We control our dynamics based off of how many stops we pull out, the more stops typically the louder, and also something called shades or boxes. There are pedals down here that operate the shades, which are essentially these huge wooden slats that open and close, much like, I don't know, Venetian blinds, thus allowing the sound to speak more clearly into the room or be muffled. So we have some gradients there so we can kind of control the volume of certain enclosed divisions. Here's what the shades look like from the inside of the organ. When I adjust the pedal, it opens up, ah, I'm not strong enough to open these with my hand, these huge wooden slats which tilt to allow the pipes to speak behind them. On a piano, you'll have something called the sustain pedal, the sostenuto pedal, and when you press that, it will allow whatever you're playing to be sustained. Um, that is not the case with organs. If you want to create a legato sound, you have to do that with your fingers on the manuals. Sustain works very differently on organs. Basically, as long as you're holding down a note, it'll keep sounding until you release it. That is not true with pianos, and this is a huge hurdle for pianists to get over when they transition over to the pipe organ. Each stop is a different sound, so there are lots of different sounds. Typically, we use multiple stops for each piece of music that we're playing, and combinations of stops are called registrations. We store registrations on different memory levels and pistons. Each piston is a different combination of stops. You'll see as I push these pistons, different combinations of stops are coming out. We store then these pistons on different memory levels. Over here I have an LED readout and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of memory levels. So that's thousands and thousands of different registrations, different combinations of stops that are stored and available to me at any given time. You may have heard the expression pulling out all the stops. Obviously that refers to pipe organs. The more stops you pull on, the louder it gets. Typically you never actually use all of the stops pulled on at the same time on an organ, because if you wanted like a really big sound, you wouldn't also have some of the, the softest, most tender lyrical things in there. It would just muddy the sound a lot. But anyway, that's where it comes from. As you may already know, with pianos, for example, the length of a string determines the pitch. So a really long string would be a really low note. The same is kind of true for organs. So a really tall pipe is a really low note. Many of us remember this sort of basic math principle in which if you pluck a string and it sounds at a certain pitch and then you cut that string in half, it sounds an octave higher. And then in half again, it'll sound another octave higher than that and so forth. Each of these stops has a name. And under that name is a number. That number is the length in feet of the tallest pipe, the lowest note, on that particular rank. So for example, if I pull out a four foot principle on the grate, this pipe that produces that note is eight feet tall. If I pull out a four foot principle, that pipe is four feet tall. Um, there are some organs that have pipes as tall as 64 feet in length, which is a really tall pipe. Pipes can also be incredibly tiny, and those will be the highest, most shrill sort of sounds on an organ. They produce a sound so high that that sound is very difficult for the human ear to really discern. This organ has a couple 32-foot stops, so these would be pipes that are 32 feet long on their lowest note. They are so low that they're kind of barely audible to the human ear. You typically would never play them by themselves, but when added to a registration, it can really produce that oh, underneath. See if you can hear it. 
if you were here, you would feel the shaking of the room. And here's a stop at the very opposite extreme. This is one of our shortest pipes, our highest notes. This is a one foot um, on the swell. Not sure if you can hear it. It's so high. It's like a dog whistle. I'm going to take it down until you can hear it. It's quite high. So if this pipe is one foot in length, you can imagine how tiny that pipe is. It's like, it's like tiny. On pipe organs, there are different families of sounds, which can best be understood as different families of instruments within, say, an orchestra. If you go to a symphony, you'll see the string section, which is where you'll find your violins and your violas and your cellos. Then you'll see the woodwinds, which is where you'll see flutes and clarinets and bassoons. And then there's another family of sounds, which is the brass instruments. And that's where you'll get your trombones and your tubas and your trumpets. And, and then there's percussion. So there's different families of sounds within an orchestra, much like there are different families of sounds within an organ. On an organ, we don't have the same families, but some of them are similar. So we have strings. We also have a family called flutes. Then there are principles, mixtures, mutations, and reeds. Let's go upstairs now and I'll take you to the organ chambers. It's, it's gonna be hot up there. Here's what a rank of pipes looks like. As you can tell, there are many. We're quite high up above, several stories above the pews in the church. You can tell there's a ton of pipes over here. Little baby ones way down there. And bigger ones over here. There's another rank of pipes over there. How teeny these little pipes are. I'll just put my hand next to them. You can see how small they are. All different combinations of materials. As you can tell, there's some wooden ones down there. These sort of boxy ones. A lot of pipes. So what do these families of stops sound like? Let's start with the principles. The principles are known as being the foundations of the organ and they're often literally referred to in scores as foundations. Here's an eight foot principle, which means that it is sounding at concert pitch. If I play a middle C, it will sound a middle C. And the eight foot principle sounds like this. There are principles on other manuals as well. Here's a principle on the positif. And here's a principle in the pedal. We also have a four foot principle, which sounds an octave higher. If I pull out an eight foot principle, a four foot principle, and a two foot principle together, this is something called a principal chorus. Using a principal chorus in the grate and also a principal chorus on the pedal is a pretty common hymn accompaniment. So if you're listening to an organist accompany a hymn, chances are they're probably using some of these stops. Another family of sounds are the flutes. The flutes typically have sort of breathier, more lyrical, timbral qualities. There are some flutes that can be really lyrical and warm. Like this Borden and the Swell. Other flutes can be more soloistic and, and uh, a little bit more cute in their timbre. This is a four foot flute in the positif. Here's an example of a two foot flute. Let's talk about strings. The string family is obviously not like literal strings. If you go up into the organ chambers, you're not gonna find violins. These are all sounds that are still produced by pipes. <clears throat> But we call them strings because of the sort of lush tonal quality that they have. So here's what the strings sound like on the swell.
They're very warm. They're very lush. Ah, I love the strings. A particularly interesting string stop is the celeste or the voix celeste. This is a stop that's intentionally tuned a little bit sharp so that it creates a, a more noticeable beat in the sound wave and therefore kind of a warmer sound. What do I mean by that? I mean, instead of it sounding like, ah, it sounds like, ah, which sort of creates this warm tapestry of sounds that a lot of people enjoy. Here's a flute without the celeste. And here's with the celeste. You can kind of hear it. When you combine the strings with the flutes, that's another particularly lovely sound. Here's a combination of strings and flutes on the swell. You can tell which stops are mixtures because instead of having numbers underneath their name, they have Roman numerals, uh, which designate how many pipes are sounding for each one note that's depressed. So for a four rank mixture, for example, that means that four notes are sounding for every one note that is depressed. So this symbol on the swell division is a three to five rank mixture. That means that for every one note that I play, there is three, four, or even five pipes that are sounding at the same time. Typically, you won't really use these mixtures by themselves, but when combined with other stops, they're actually really kind of cool. Here's some other mixtures on different divisions. Without the mixture, Here is a principal chorus through a mixture on the positive division. Without the mixture. So they really kind of add a lot of brilliance to the top of registers. And then we have mutations. Mutations are really weird. You'll see on mutation stops that the numbers underneath the name of the stop are actually fractions. What? Mutations don't sound at the fundamental, and that's why. What does that mean? If I play a C, I'll hear a C. But if I play this mutation on the positive division, this is a Nazard, it's two and two thirds, I'm actually hearing a G an octave and a half above the C. I'm playing a C, but I'm hearing a G. Here's another one. If I pull on the tierce on the positive division, that is sounding a couple octaves and a third above the note that I'm actually playing. So I'm playing a middle C, but what I'm hearing is an E, <laughs> two octaves and a third above that. Here's another one. Uh, the quint flute is a one and one thirds, which means that if I play that, I'm actually hearing a G, which is two and a half octaves above the fundamental. I'm hearing that note, right? <laughs> really weird. Again, you wouldn't typically use these stops by themselves, but when added to other combinations of stops, they can be really effective. Check it out. Here is an eight foot flute with a two and two thirds mutation. Here's an even cuter one. This is a four-foot flute with a, a one and three-fifths mutation. A bunch of really interesting reeds on this organ, and some of them are quite loud. This is what a rank of reed pipes looks like. If you look carefully, you can see that there's actually literally a reed right there, um, and that's how these pipes are tuned. And there's, of course, a thermometer <laughs> to make sure that this chamber stays within a certain range of temperatures. Over here on the swell we have an obois. This is a French reed. It sounds kind of lyrical like this. I kind of like it when paired with an eight-foot flute.
We also have a voix humaine, which is the human voice that's in French. I don't know any human voices that sound like that, but that is typically the name of a stop that sounds like that. We also have a, <laughs> a crumb horn. This is a historical stop. It's really buzzy and uh, it has its place, but I don't play it a lot. As you can tell, the organ is quite out of tune right now. Quarantine. Uh, we also have some particularly gnarly reeds in the pedal division. Here's a few of them. Here's an eight foot trumpet in the pedal. Here's a 16 foot pazauna. And of course, the 32 foot pazauna. I never use this one. Yeah, it's, uh, it's something. <laughs> we also actually have a two-foot reed in the pedal division. Check this out. Over here, we have a trumpet à pavillon. This would essentially be like your trumpet en chamade. The trumpet en chamade is a very loud stop. It is often horizontally mounted on organs, which kind of look really cool, so it kind of juts out into the space. Here's the trumpet, a pavillon. Woo, it's loud. These white tabs above the manuals are called couplers. Couplers allow stops that are associated with one manual to be playable on another manual. So here's a eight foot flute on the swell, which typically wouldn't be playable on the grate. But if I couple it down from the swell to the grate, now I can play it here as well. What I'd like to do now is demonstrate these different stops and registrations with uh, a piece that you all know probably really well. This is an arrangement of Amazing Grace, super famous tune. And I'll tell you what registrations I'm pulling out and what stops you're hearing as they come. So I'm going to start with a solo stop on the swell division. This is this manual over here. And this is a eight foot flute with a mutation, a two and two thirds quint. I'm using some flutes in the pedal and I'm using some flutes and a principal on the grate to accompany it. <laughs> using flutes and strings that are all coupled to the grate. And this is what happens when I open the box. You'll hear it get louder. Now I'm pulling on more stops. There were the four foots. That's why it sounded so much higher. All right. Now, so I'm going to do for this verse is use an eight foot reed and bois, and an eight foot flute on the swell division over here for my left hand and with my right hand I'm going to accompany it with an eight foot flute on the grate. Oh gosh, it's so out of tune. Sorry guys. 
guys. And now I'm bringing it down to the positive where I have an eight foot flute and a two foot flute. just hit another piston. This is now a bunch of flutes and a bunch of strings. And we also are coupling down our reeds. So we're going to close the box here so we have ultimate amount of expression. I just love this sound. It's so rich and decadent and indulgent and full. It's got some gnarl to it. It's really nice. Starting with the shades closed, but I'll open them up and you'll hear the difference. That's part of the registration. Last thing we do is take off the principles. Isn't that lovely? All right, and now I'm going to close with um, a toccata on Amazing Grace. I will not interrupt it this time, and you can hear for yourself the different combinations of stops. Um, I encourage you to guess them, and I can correct you if, you're, uh, if you'd like. <laughs> and I'm gonna show you three different camera angles so you can watch the pedals and the manuals and then the full frame shot as well. So I hope you enjoy this, and thanks again for tuning in. <laughs>